You have to be able to see the reward in order for you to uh, beat your flesh into subjection to the Holy Spirit at all times. If you can't see the reward, you accept the sword. And the sword really represents the curse. It means the devourer is given place. There's a constant desire inside of the, the Holy Spirit to guide you into prayers of need for the Father. Prayers of need for the Father. You know what that means? Uh, prayers that the theme of those prayers is you putting in an application to show the Lord that you need his help, his assistance, that you're incapable of your function and your programming will malfunction without his assistance. When, when any man put his trust in the power of God, the power of God starts to trust that man. When any man pits his trust in the power of God, the power of God starts to trust that man. So the power of God, the evidence of God's power is increased. Always remember that. The evidence of God's power is increased. How do you know that God's power is present? Increase. The increase of comfort. The increase of answers, the increase of investors, the increase of self-control. The evidence of God's power in any environment is increased, the increase of peace, the increase of unity. That's why the power of God fell in Acts because of the increase of unity. What was the Holy Spirit waiting for? Why did the day of Pentecost, what is the significance of the day of Pentecost? The day of Pentecost is really the finalization of unity. The day of Pentecost is the finalization of unity. It is the, 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 the end result that everybody came into agreement with the spirit of God's mind. That the word of the Lord became the first priority of everybody in the room. The day of Pentecost is more than just a uh, denomination. It, it, see, they made uh, denominations off of, see, there was John the Baptist. Then they made a denomination called Baptist. There was the day of Pentecost, then they made Pentecostals. Man always doing stuff that God don't got nothing to do with. Is, is, is even in religiosity and tradition. That's why traditions of men make the word of God not effect. Because traditions of men is where Satan tells you what is godly. Did you hear me? The traditions of men is where Satan begins to disciple you on what is of God. So then when, when the Holy Spirit starts to tell you what's of God, you, now you got to combat what the devil done told you because the devil presented the devil's self as if the devil was Jesus. Remember I told you in witchcraft, which is a part of tradition, which is a part of self-righteousness, Jesus looks like the devil and the devil looks like Jesus. So when people step into witchcraft, they call good evil and evil good. I think that was Isaiah the prophet that prophesied about that day, that there will come a day where they will call good evil and evil good. There are many benefits that happen when God give you a prophet of God. The Bible said, touch not my anointed ones, but then it said, do not my prophet any harm. The, the, one of the meanings in the Hebrew for harm one of the meanings, the definitions was to affect. The text is, when it says, do my prophet no harm, don't affect your prophet negatively. Don't bring sadness to him when he is uh, 
audience for your words, your deeds, your life decisions. So what is the opposite of harming your prophet? Believe in your prophet. And belief is an act of worship. When you believe somebody, you have to worship their philosophy. You have to worship their mentality. You have to worship their preference. You have to worship what they are requesting, what they are teaching, what they are mentoring. Life is full of worship. You worship the, the speed limit so that you don't get a speeding ticket. You worship a store's mandate for you to wear a mask so that they don't pitch you out the store so you can buy the object. You worship pitting the gas pump into your gas tank, not pitting it in your mouth. <laughs> you ever saw somebody drinking the gas tank, a gas pump? But the reason why you pit it in your gas tank is because you worship the idea that the person gave to pit the gas pump in the gas tank. You see? There are people taking prescription pills today because you worship your doctor. It was your doctor that prescribed the pill. You take the pill because you worship the doctor. It was the doctor that told you to take the pill. So life is full of worship. It matters who you worship. Worship, the word means that you become a servant of somebody's desires. Well, that's what worship means. It means that you become a doer of somebody's rules. The Bible says, if you believe the prophet, so shall you prosper. So when the Bible said, I wish above all things in third John, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. I, I wish above all things. See, the Lord's biggest wish is that you prosper. So you understand that the Lord's biggest wish is that you would receive the word of the Lord coming out of your prophet. So that's why the major thing, look, look the Lord is resurrected from the dead. And look at the doctrine of Apostle Paul. He said that he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. And he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets. In the other three offices. But you notice why is Jesus doing this ASAP? Because he is unveiling his government. This is my major wish. You, you know, whatever you do first is your major wish. You know that, right? If you go, if you enter into your house and the first thing that you go is go pee inside of a bathroom, that means that that was your major wish. You can't say that your major wish was to, uh, uh, to fold laundry clothes because that wasn't the first thing you targeted to accomplish. You can't say that your major wish was to um, eat an apple because you didn't eat the apple. You went go use the restroom. The first thing that the Lord is doing is establishing his major wish, which is prosperity. Prosperity is not a doctrine of a man. It's not a doctrine even of a a pastor is not a doctrine of somebody that is, is called by God. Prosperity is the doctrine of God before he made man. Remember, he pit man, if you read the Bible, he took man and pit man in the midst of the garden. This garden was made by God with every good tree, with every good encounter, every good experience, every good provision. That's prosperity. This is what Satan don't want people to understand. Prosperity was that the father is a rich person. He's rich. He's wealthy. He has a son, Jesus. He's rich. He's wealthy. His son is carrying his inheritance. He gives his son the power to create the heavens and the earth. Hallelujah. 
and his son decorates the heaven and the earth. It's the beautiful scenery that we see today, every day. And guess what? Jesus pits all these beautiful provisions and all these beautiful objects in the earth and he decorates the earth with prosperity. So prosperity has nothing to do with a man that is a preacher or a woman that is prophetic. It has everything to do with a God that had all power in his hand to do what he wanted. And he has all these possessions. And he says, I want to make a creation that's in my image and likeness for them to enjoy my possessions and walk in my dominion like I walk in dominion. I want them to create like me. So when God gave Adam the seed, he was given Adam a, a device of technology from eternity. It wasn't a doctrine that Adam created or Abram created. It was God giving him a material. This is the material I use to create. It's called seed. And then God put the material in Adam's body. It's called sperm, but it's called seed. So every time Adam used any type of seed, then he put also the seed in Adam's voice box, his brain, his soul, which is words. See, there are different type of seeds, but God is so obsessed with the seed that he made different formats of seed. Seed, he put the seed in the man's body. He put the seed in the man's soul. Then he put the seed in the man's hands. <laughs> oh my goodness. Whoa. He put the seed in his body. He put the seed in his soul. Then he put the seed in his hands. He surrounded the man with the seed because he's saying this is the material that you need to create like I create. Does the Holy Ghost have sperm? Yes. The Holy Ghost has sperm. It was the sperm of the Holy Ghost that entered into Mary. The Holy Ghost came upon her and impregnated her with his sperm, with his seed. My goodness. So I want you to understand this. The born again process in, in Mary conceived Jesus. She conceived Jesus. The born again process is the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that you could be born of the seed that he has. And what is one of the names of his seed? His sperm is called Word of God. Oh my gosh. His sperm is called Word of God. His sperm is called word of God. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you become born again, the seed, the sperm of the Holy Ghost, that's what you are made up of. And the same way if a man is a drunk and he has a child, that child got to break the spirit of drunk heart because that addiction, that yoke is being transferred through his seed because that's where his life is when he impregnates the woman. So whatever he is, is now being transferred to that child. So you understand that men are governing their children and the nature in which they have in the beginning. Now watch this here. That's why you got to be real easy on some people because um, sometimes you might look at somebody might be a man of God or something. And then like their child, their child could turn out to be a homosexual or something like that. Where you got to be easy because that child could learn homosexuality. 
are you seeing? I mean, the child going to have encounters with evil. The child could let evil in it. The child could not guard its heart. And that child could let evil in. That doesn't mean that that man of God is a homosexual. But what it does convey that um, corruption could happen if that child desires, I don't want to go after the things of the spirit. Remember Samuel's sons. Samuel is a man of God, a prophet of God, but his sons are wicked. And that's why you understand that in life, when the Holy Spirit call you away, even from children, he can see the future better than you can. When the Holy Spirit separates you from people, he knows why he's separating you from them because he can see the future. That's why to be led by the spirit is to be led into safety, to lead, be led into consolation, which is comfort. Because he can see the future about people. Remember. Um, your child could learn things and rebel against you if they choose. Remember, these are called the sons of God in the book of Job. So these are God's sons. These angels are his children. They're his sons. But look who they are today. Accusers, liars. They're the spirit of fear. They're the spirit of the thief. They're the spirit of lust. They are the spirit of anxiety. These are God's sons. This is what they chose to do with their will. So in the case of a parent being a man of God, their child could turn and use their will to do evil and accumulate a lifestyle and an image that goes against the divine sperm, the the life of righteousness that a man of God is living. That's very possible. Life is full of surprises, by the way. And um, the more that you pray in the spirit, uh, prayer prepares you for what's coming. When you pray in the spirit, you edify yourself, you build yourself up so that when things happen, they don't utterly kill you off and then you stop serving God. You, you want to die. You remember Elijah started praying to die. That's why you always have to be in prayer because even when things are going well, you don't know the decisions that people are making around you. You don't know wh what they are choosing to do. And um, there's something that happened like uh, on my cell phone, on my cell phone, it keeps on saying, uh, we want to update the, the phone to this version. And, and what's wild is they, they always want to update it during the night. Okay, look at this here. So when you wake up, sometimes you look at your phone and your phone turn blank and you got you to gotta go through all these different phases because it updated to a new version. And now the, the, the phone has different abilities that it's doing. That's uncommon to what you formerly knew it would do. Well, also in life, there are people that get updated by demons. And when the demons update them, they, they have new abilities to rebel against God, new abilities to defy their image of God, the likeness of God, and to do things that they normally would not do. And they're updated. There are people that are updated into oldness. So the update is to be evil. Now, there's an update in the Holy Ghost. When people get updated, your righteousness is higher. You bear more fruit. You remember I, I, I had that scripture in 1 John. Uh, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. Let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. I think that's 1 John chapter 3, verse 7. So the more that you're doing righteousness, the more you're doing things God's way, the more that his way is being made clear to you. There is a harvest time for your life when you're sowing. God is a party in God. That's why King Jesus turned the water into wine, but he turned the water into a wine in, at a party. The power of God fell at a party. The book of Revelation talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. King Jesus is a partying Jesus. He likes to party. 
But he has you so, so that you can access the party, the grace to party with God. Due season is a party time of your life where God restores back unto you the years, Joel chapter 2, verse 25 and on. Restore back unto you the years that the locust, the canker worm, the pommel worm, the caterpillar had ate, eaten from you. All those times where you were robbed of what you were supposed to unlock through sowing because other things was taking up your time. That's why every time God ministers seed to you, he is eager to party with you. If you keep on sowing, you'll keep on partying all the days of your life. Due season is a party time. The reason why when Solomon sowed that thousand burnt offerings, God said, what shall I give you? God ready to party. Isaac sowed in a famine while everybody is in lack. And God said, now it's time for you to party. I want I've been waiting to party with you, but you're not sowing the seed. New Testament seed sowing is not Old Testament and it's not New Testament. It's heaven's testament. As long as the earth remains, the Bible said there be seed, time, and harvest is not divided by covenant because the seed was created to saturate and permeate one's life with partying, that you'll be able to enjoy God's goodness and his loving kindness towards you and that you will be able to see the people that have been sent to bless you and cause your life to become easy. Delightful. That's why Psalm 37, verse 4 and on, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. When you're sowing into God, there's a party time, there's a harvest time. The harvest is a partying power from God where you get to enjoy yourself. That's why you see, um, what's that in Timothy that said that he gives you all things to richly enjoy? <laughs> 